Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. My name is Oliver Wieck. I'm the Secretary General of ICC Germany and I cordially invite you, uh, welcome you to our workshop on the digitalization of supply chains, which we are hosting together with our valued partners, Deutsche Post DHL and uh, DVV Media Group. This is the second of a series of workshops of the ICC Forum, the future of international supply chains, sustainable, digital and smart. The forum was inaugurated on June 16 together with a high-level political panel, including the executive director of the International Trade Center, Pamela Cook Hamilton, two German state secretaries, and the CEO of Deutsche Post, DHL Frank Appel. Around 500 registrations for this workshop is a clear indication that digital transformation is in full swing. In this workshop, you will learn from corporates how digitalization improves the resilience of supply chains which impact it has on suppliers and customers, and how corporates manage the dig digital change in their companies. In the second part, startups present their digital projects to improve the efficiency, transparency, and resilience of your supply chain. Join us and benefit from the in-depth experience of our distinguished panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, I am more than delighted that Sebastian Reimann agreed to moderate today's workshop. Sebastian is Editor-in-Chief at Deutsche Verkehrszeitung, an indispensable media for all professionals in the transport and logistics sector. So besides being an eloquent moderator, Sebastian is up to date with the most recent developments and trends in this sector in general and in supply chain issues in particular. Before I hand over, I want to thank the distinguished panelists for your time and dedication and our dear participants for your interest in today's workshop and for joining us. Sebastian. The floor is yours. Oliver, thank you very much and a warm welcome from my side as well. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, it's a very important topic. It's a topic that uh, a lot of us have to deal with. I mean, if I look at the international supply chains, I think uh, there has never been uh, more need to really uh, do the supply chain management efficiently, to use the newest technology uh, I, I guess everybody knows the news surrounding the international supply chains. We talk about tight transport capacity in container shipping, in the internet networks, everything. We talk about lots of uncertainties. Uh, COVID can really spread everywhere. Uh, we know the uh, development in the port of Yantian uh, the last couple of weeks. So nothing is really safe. We, we know that the stock situation is low. Um, a lot of uh, stock has to be rebuild and a lot of uh, transport demand therefore are in the international supply chains and from that um, we have a lot of questions uh, being dis discussed uh, what is the state of the international supply chain these days what trends and technologies of course um, really drive the change in the international supply chains and of course, utmost our topic of today is how can digital digitalization and how can digital solutions like platforms and other um, things uh, really help to make the international supply chains more resilient. Um, as Oliver has mentioned, we have two uh, great panels with, with experts from the shipper side. That's our first uh, panel, which I would like to introduce in just a minute. Our second panel a little later on will be on uh, startups and um, a lot of experts working in these startups and really looking for solutions. So we have kind of both sides. We have the demand side and uh, we have the uh, side of the, uh, let's say, smart little solution providers. Um, yeah, before um, we start and I introduce our three panelists, which you can already see, um, I would like to get you involved. You will see a chat function on your um, a panel on your screen, which I would really like to encourage you to, to use heavily. Um, this is, for me, of course, as a media, media representative, this session, it's very important, very interesting for me and our readers. But of course, this is for you as, um, as, uh, as listeners today. Um, you can raise your questions, you can make remarks, and I will then uh, direct them to our panelists. So let's get started. Um, you can see Dagmar Joswig, uh, a great welcome to you, Dagmar. Let me introduce you real quick. Um, you are the Vice President and Head of Corporate IT Office and Digitalization at Deutsche Post DHL. Um, pretty much the, the largest um, logistics provider we have in the world. Um, 
you have been with Deutsche Post since 2007, um, and before you just started your current position, uh, I think beginning of this year, you have been with the forwarding decision for lots of years, always involved in IT topics. So uh, we, we, we talked uh, before we started this session, and you just said, if you don't know about digitization, who else in Deutsche Post? So it's a great pleasure to have you. Thanks a lot for the warm welcome, Sebastian. And honestly, you gave me all the keywords already. Yeah. So right. when we talk, yeah, when we talk about supply chains, actually, I think what we need to really understand first is what makes them so valuable, yeah, and what makes them so vulnerable before yeah. we can really talk about how digitalization can help us there. Yeah. And when you look at the, the recent developments, I guess all the participants in the call, yeah, you just look at yourself. I guess hopefully most of you have already enjoyed your morning coffee today. I can guarantee you that 99% of the coffee beans come from somewhere else than Europe. Yeah, um, Just look around you, your clothes. If you are valid for any statistics, 80% of all your clothes are somewhere from Asia. Yeah. And um, just look at your computer in front of you and your iPhone or whatever lies on the table. Um, it comes from China. Yeah. And that's the short version of just how globalized we are in this world since the last 30 years. Yeah? I think somehow we never really realized that. We only realized that in moments when, when it comes really near and dear to us. Yeah? And, and so what we are doing at DHL frequently has become more and more attuned to this globalization. That means while we started out in more local businesses or cross-border trade, right now about 80, 90% of all our volumes that we're handling are really going truly international with, with an average 2.5 uh, border um, uh, crossings of everything along the way. Yeah? And um, most of it is really truly intercontinental. Yeah? And that is just how global we are. So um, 220 countries, I guess that already says it. I think you, the UN counts two less. We just count everything a country that has established a border and a customs office yeah? and say, okay, we have to comply. So that's that's for us a global supply chain. Yeah? So, and when you look at this, how vulnerable really are they? Yeah? Just look at what Sebastian just said right now, Corona. So what happened there was within weeks, within weeks, yeah, half of our capacity for air freight our usual plant capacity was gone because we co-load half of, of what we do with, with um, passenger flights. So within weeks, the whole game changed. Yeah? That is just how vulnerable we are. Additionally to that, we had to send our own people home to home office like everybody else. Yeah? And to be honest, um, the ICC has featured the, the, the paperless trade uh, on your website before, if you have a look at this um, later on. If we wouldn't have employed paperless trade before Corona, we'd be dead in the sand by Corona, to be honest. Yeah? Because our people just had to continue the same work that they were doing in the office before from home. I think that makes it much more tangible yeah, what that really means, how vulnerable that is, and how, how daily changing everything is. Or just take the current flood in Germany to make one other example. Yeah? Um, what happened there was we do a lot of transportation in Germany down the Rhine River. We do a lot of our transport in, in road networks and rail networks. All of a sudden, in one day, half of that was gone in the Rhine area, as well as in the very vulnerable uh, Limburg area in, in Netherlands, as well as in Belgium, etc. So what that means is we really need to see day to day how we react to these influences, which are not at all under, under, under our control, yeah? um, and get our supply chains in the sense resilient that we still can deliver because what these people in the region right now need, apart from the first need to get to safety, to shelter, to clean water, 
but that's already done already. Now, a few days later, they need everything. They need tools, they need machinery, they need wood, they need everything. Yeah. And for that, we really need to react on a day-to-day -day base. How can we organize that? How can we get it to the people? And that's really the core of a supply chain, to deliver that value to the people without them even thinking too much about it. Yeah? And now I really can come, once that is clarified, how really, really vulnerable and important these supply chain are to us, yeah? what is digitalization doing for that? Digitalization is seen at DHL as one of the biggest helper that came along to do that. Yeah? Now more than ever, we are able to track all our goods on the way and not only track where they are, but how they are. Take Corona again, cool chains, everything needs to be cooled, the vaccines, right? We need to, we want to know as customers, is that cooling chain unbroken through the transport chain? That is what our sensors do. That is where we heavily employ them right now. So we don't wait for big time industrial um, solutions that kind of solve every problem in one. We take what we get right now. That's our approach to digitalization. Apply it to our supply chain and make it help us to, to make our lives better. Yeah, and to make the lives of our customer better. So IoT sensors are already mentioned. Um, tracking APIs is a big one as well. Analytics, methods to reroute, to forecast the best route that is the best tomorrow, not today, um, is a big thing in our company. So the way we structure it is basically 95% we leave to our local stations, to our local people who know best what is the situation there and now in the country, in the station, there in the area? And 5% we build up common group-wide centers of excellence for specific digitalization topics we have identified. Yeah, and one of them I already mentioned, that's the data analytics. Um, two others to just mention, so the IoT I already said, Automation of operations is a classic one, yeah, where we have like automate our warehouse um, stuff, make it easier for people. We actually use exoskeletons, like the, the movie stuff that everybody like dreams about. We use them in daily life to make our life easier when our people have to heavy lift stuff. Yeah? And that is, I think, how our general approach to digitalization really works is to make it a practical helper for us, for our customer, for our providers, for all of them along the supply chain together. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your words, for your introductory words. And maybe one quick question from my side. I mean, you, you just referred on the things we all um, see on TV, the Rhine River, everything. Of course, these situations are far from normal, right? But um, I mean, has the, um, the pace in the supply chains overall um, also increased in the couple of months, years? I mean, do you have to react faster overall um, if you look apart from these uh, extraordinary situations like we just, just witnessed? Yeah, again, um, the pace has drastically increased. The expectations have drastically increased. People today, everybody wants to know where his goods are and if his goods are in good status, basically on a click of the fingertip. That's that's expected from mm -hmm. just about everybody. Yeah, But also what I wanted to point out, um, I think the crisis mode is somehow getting the new normal mm -hmm. in a way that, I mean, climate change is just something that happens. The statistics speak their own language yeah somewhere there's always something yeah? and you ha you just have to move your way around ever quicker and with ever longer and more complex supply chains and in that way yes we have increased the speed over the last years dramatically reacting to these things and preparing for the unknown but that's all about making the supply chain resilient mm -hmm. i think 
higher expectations is a good word and and with that i would like to get our second panelist into the round um because uh, his his words introductory words will be about the role of the people and how to get them involved in the digitization of processes and all these kind of things dr klaus staubitzer he's the cpo and head of supply chain at siemens ag Dr. Staubitzer, it's great to have you here. Um, let me introduce you just real quick with a few words. Um, you have been the CPO since 2014. Um, before that, you have been responsible for different business segments and business units uh, within Siemens as CEO and, and CFO. So, I mean, Siemens is a huge world. I would imagine the supply chain of, of Siemens is kind of a huge world in, its, in itself. And uh, I know you, I know you know what it's what it's for, and um, it's great to have you. And we're looking forward to hear what you have to say about this, uh, the supply chain of Siemens. Yeah, Sebastian, many thanks for having me here in in this session. And and before I start, a few words about Siemens and what we are doing uh, regarding the transformation process. I would like to refer to what Dagmar said. First of all, we have a very close relationship to our dear friend from DHL, and I can confirm. It's a very, it's, it's a massive, a massive uh, performance level what you guys have achieved over the last years, and uh, only can can congratulate to to this transformation process. That's that's what we see as a as a customer from you. So, and I also noticed that you you mentioned these. We have to prepare for the unexpected, yeah, and we also have to shift from this crisis mode into this reinvention mode. This is something which I also see in our company. But um, let's go back to, to this transformation process. Um, I can remember when one of our board members came to me, and I guess it was in 2016 or 2017 around, he came from this famous World Economic Forum. And he said, hey, look, Klaus, I, I saw a presentation and somebody said 80% of the existing support functions can already be digitized with the existing technical equipment, which is and was available already in 2016 or 17. Okay, so then we had the question, what does that mean for us as a function? What do we have to do? Or is digitalization really a big lever to change our processes, to change our behavior, or can digitalization help us to transform, and this was our mantra, to transform our function from a pure cost cutter to a value add orchestrator? So what did we do? We worked out uh, in different, um, and they call it digi labs at that point in time. There were a lot of um, consultants around all these typical suspects you may know. And they offer you these experience. You sit together in a um, virtual environment. You can try something out and you, you do something, how it feels if you move your processes from, from the traditional uh, structure into this virtual environment. And I said, OK, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, if we just digitize a crappy process, probably we will have a digitized crappy process. So then we started to rethink what do we have to do to really change our, our legacies and, and, and maybe Dagmar can also confirm uh, digitalization has a lot of things to do with um, moving the old IT structure into the new area and uh, we have only within Siemens I guess we have more than 50 different SAP systems. So the huge brownfield of IT structures we have to move. So what I'm trying to say, with all these labs we had experience, we get the impression it's not a technical issue because the technique is around us. It is a transformation of the process. And I can really remember when we had our um, final discussion right after one of these uh, lab discussions, and, and people ask me, so where is now our master plan? Because that the, in companies like Siemens, people always ask for a master plan. And, and this is how we did it in the past. We send out the master plan into the organization, and then we expect that people implement 
And, and there was also the discussion we had regarding visualization. And, and then I can really remember that one, uh, one talent we invited, by the way, for these, um, for these sessions, also our talent, and one, one talent stood up and said, hey, can I ask a question? And I said, yeah, of course. And the talent said, I'm not so much convinced that the top-down approach, rolling out a DG master plan, will really make it. And we turn around and said, what? <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Is there any other idea you have? And, and the talent said, why don't we try it this time with a bottom-up approach? And we saw, okay, what does it really mean? What do you mean with bottom-up approach? And, and then we talked about the idea, is there an opportunity to go out into the organization, ask the people what they think they can do with digital ideas and tools to make their life easier instead of drill down a top-down approach and say, you have to do this and that. And we started out with five people. They walked out into the organization and they asked people for their cool ideas, what they can do to digitize their area of responsibility. And meanwhile, we have more than 500 people who are doing that constantly, self-motivated, self-organized to manage their area of responsibility. And in addition, we laid out accelerating processes. That means uh, all the cool ideas which they might have, we make it transparent and display that to the organization. Fund the stuff so that they can um, achieve a certain level, for example, a proof of concept where we can think about is it worthwhile scaling up these cool ideas? So what we achieve with this kind of uh, approach is we can address a broader number of people. We can address the people globally. We can motivate the people. And this is really something which I also have to say, I wasn't really quite sure that this, this approach will work. But, but meanwhile, we see there are so many ideas coming around. There are so many motivation in the organization that people now see digitalization not as a threat, they see it more as an opportunity. And again, do what Dharma said. Of course, you have to provide a, a framework in which they can operate. But then, based on that, you have to give the people the freedom to act. Otherwise, they are too narrow in, in, in these kind of frameworks and they cannot really operate. And they see then digitalization as a threat. And, and of course, we have all these things, artificial intelligence, um, sourcing bots, and, and all that kind of stuff in place. But the real kick is, how can you scale up all these nice ideas and tools? Scale up is, at the very end, the decisive process, because that leads you to the real impact. And, and I think that is something a little bit underestimated if you talk to other companies because they always say, yeah, we have a real cool um, pilot case. And I say, of course, the good companies can do all these nice pilot cases. And maybe later on in the panel, you see other companies, these startup companies who provide us a lot of good stuff. But I truly believe the real the real good companies, they have the ability to scale up, to hyperscale these pilot cases and these things which really makes a difference. But at the very end, and this is my, my uh, truly belief, people really make a fundamental difference. People always make a difference if you have a transformation process, but is in this digital transformation process. It's even more important that you address the people on a global base and keep these people motivated. Thank you very much. Um, Klaus, if, if you look at the, the process, which probably hasn't ended yet and probably will never end, uh, I, I guess it's a constant transformation process. Um, what idea really 
struck you? What really surprised you maybe with regard to your um, resort supply chain um, and everything that you probably wouldn't have figured out yourself? I mean, what came bottom up that really that, surprised that's, you? That's really interesting question. And, and I can remember we had tons and we had really a lot of good ideas. But what really struck me the most was people came up with an idea of a DG mindset training course. And, and they developed by themselves a training course which allows you in one day to, to get all these things. How can you hack your processes? How can you use some digi tools? And then everybody takes his own challenge, which is around in his area of responsibility, work on that challenge and share it with the other people. And then if they find a solution to put it into a repository that everybody can um, build on that or can benefit from that. And meanwhile, we have in that training more than thousand people mm. and the whole training was created from these people it was not a training course we rolled out through the organization it was built from the people for the people and was completely and it's it's really it's true it's completely self-organized and self-motivated mm. really yeah, amazing amazing which kind of expertise we gain out of that i think we will get into this later on and uh, i see the first questions coming in from the audience i will i will uh, direct them to you a little later on um just uh, everybody from the audience please raise your voice ask your questions um but before we get into the discussion um i would like to introduce our third speaker dr alexander bartran and if I look at your CV uh, from, from Void Group, you are the Vice President Purchasing Strategy and Methods um, at Void Group. Alexander, it's great to have you here. And um, if I look at your CV, I would say I have to introduce you kind of as a purchasing pope. I mean, you have, uh, you have spent your whole career with purchasing. You have, uh, you have been um, 10 years in management consulting in procurement. Um, you are also a co-author of the book Procurement 4.0. So I think that's, you can probably tell us a lot about procurement of the future. Um, and um, uh, you are with Ford since 2018 and uh, we are very interested to hear what you have to say about, yeah, kind of how to get involved the suppliers and everything in a, in a digitized uh, supply chain. So. The floor is yours for the next 10 minutes, Alexander. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for your, for your introduction. So, yeah, um, probably uh, DHL and, and Siemens are uh, well-known companies. So probably you have less touch points with Foyt. So Foyt is a uh, global technology company for paper making machines, uh, hydropower plants and drive systems and technologies. Um, some figures. Uh, uh, one of every three uh, paper sheets is coming from a Foyt paper machine. 25% uh, of electricity produced by a hydropower is coming from a power plant uh, equipped by a Foyt. And um, yeah, the company itself, 20,000 employees, uh, around about uh, more than 4 billion sales and activities in more than 60 countries. Um, we, we are talking about supply chain and supply chain resilience, but what drives our complexity and is important to know when we are talking about digitization is the, the complexity uh, for, for purchasing coming from characteristics of project business. So we are not in an, in an environment that is highly repetitive. So we are rather in, a, in an environment where we have even uh, many A suppliers and A parts with a low repetition rate. So um, this is uh, what, 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 what leads us in our digitization discussion. Um, we have a kind of master plan, uh, but <laughs> not drilled down uh, uh, to, to, to each and every detail, but we have, a, we, have a, we have a vision. And our vision has, has a headline, and this headline is, is collaboration, collaboration internal and external. So uh, for, for the uh, participants coming from serious business, maybe it's nothing new to have a, a closely integrated supply base with a tire structure. But for project business, um, 
we are still on a way to have an, an, an completely integrated uh, um, approach with our, our suppliers. So uh, this is on the one hand side. So, but what are the trends that drive us in our discussion? So, because we have a long history uh, as, as DHL and Siemens as well with purchasing systems in place. So more than 20 years beside the ERP system, but what's different today? Uh, that's the that's the question so digitization but what's different today and we see three trends that are very different so one is um as i said our following our headline it's it's a kind of era of of collaboration connectivity and um, user experience as class said user centricity coming from the users uh, users needs uh, the the uh, what what makes their life easier their business life is very important um, we, we have now capabilities where we no, no longer have a fragmented uh, system landscape. So we call it an end-to-end -end, uh, collaboration from our suppliers to our customers. And second, and this refers also to the startups that are coming later, so we have uh, no more entry barriers for new software vendors. So imagine 10 years ago, we had just 10 procurement applications around. Yeah? So it was all on premise. Now we have cloud and we have thousands. Yeah? So it feels like every day a new startup. Uh, and and uh, as you said, um, of course, you can do every day a new POC, proof of concept, and but you have to scale it. You have to decide the right one and then to scale it. So I fully agree with that. Um, so the question is the right one to choose. And finally, it's not just about efficiency. So we all know it's about effectiveness, um, uh, better decision making by proper data management and easy accessible information. So some would say data is the new oil or tsunami of information, all these buzzwords are spreading around. Coming to our kind of strategy uh, digitization roadmap. So first of all, we are building at the moment a true end-to-end -end system landscape, including our suppliers. Um, we're thinking about complementary best of breed applications for special purpose like risk, risk management or risk methods we see later on. Um, and we heavily invest in a, in a, from my point of view, very important topic, it's data management. So it's, it's a prerequisite for connecting all these nice and, 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 and fruitful apps, but it's all about proper, proper master data. So, and this brings me uh, to, to more details about it. Talking about purchasing, we are the highest integrated function in the company. So it starts with sales, product management, engineering, supply chain management, logistics, operations, accounting. Every, everybody is, is, has some stakes with, with uh, purchasing and vice versa. So it's, it's all about collaboration. And we try to, to bring these parties closer together by, by uh, nice tools um, so that they can collaborate in context and not uh, spreading out in different applications and not um, uh, with, with, with no user experience at all. And thinking about our customers, we also integrated our customers, for example, spare parts web shops with our um, upstream um, ordering system. So our customer places an order and this goes directly or is translated in our ordering system towards our suppliers. So um, this is also something we, we keep in mind talking about digitization. And as said, we leverage, um, of course, this digital core or legal, bla legal blade, uh, base blade, however you call it. Uh, we leverage this with best of breed apps, um, like uh, scouting for new suppliers with AI based technologies. Um, but also, there is one huge challenge upcoming the German Supply Chain Act, uh, where some might think uh, digitization would solve that issue or that challenge, maybe it's not an issue, it's a challenge, um, but um, we have to think about mapping supply chains on supplier, on parts level, and this is nothing that can be automatically done. Maybe blockchain is coming in the future, yeah, but we are far away from that. Um, so um, this would be, would be an, 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 a mixture of digitization, but also um, a, a tremendous effort. So, and, and finally, as I said, master data is, is a prerequisite. Maybe it's the most boring part of digitization. Um, but um, coming, coming back, uh, Dagmar, what you said with the, with the flood, um, knowing where your suppliers' plants are, maybe is not just a, a topic in, in tsunami areas, but it's, we, we recognize right now that this is also a an, an, an topic for Germany. 
So knowing where the suppliers are, not just the legal entity, also the plant. Um, so the master data must be very precise, and we see we see that as an as an, a major prerequisite and invest heavily in that area. Um, yeah. So um, and that topic shows that it's not just a technical question. So it's not just a technical question how to integrate everything. It's we have some homeworks somewhere else. Um, um, and finally, yeah, people transformation. Um, that's all about. Um, what we see is that, um, and I fully agree, um, uh, implementing systems and implementing apps do not solve process issues. So um, we should really have a look on simplification first, um, not uh, to uh, search for solutions um, by apps uh, in processes that are not state of the art or not standard. And um, Finally, we see that there is a transformation of roles in purchasing coming with the digitization. So, for example, to orchestrating our end-to-end -end system landscape, we need different roles to, to drive that landscape than, uh, than before. And um, besides the users that we have to uh, bring on that journey, it's um, itself the, the roles are, are changing in, in and purchasing. So that's in a nutshell what what we are doing um, for 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 purchasing digitization. There are some good um, approaches for uh, uh, for for AI applications, um, especially in the data cleansing area. We have really good results, and we are currently scaling it up. Uh, and and for that reason, I really agree on that. So uh, decide on, on, on a path and, and stick to it and, and make it tangible and, and bottom line effective. Uh, so you need to have a closed loop. After implementation of the technology, you have to, you have to bring it on a bottom line e impact and make it PNL effective. Uh, so that's, that's our understanding. Alexander, I mean, you, you referred a lot to the, the master data, the data quality. And I think that's a very, very important point if we talk about digitization of supply chains and the digitization of the economy as a whole. I mean, we have all these great tools. We have things like AI, we have blockchain. You have just mentioned all the buzzwords, but as I understand it, all always comes down to the data behind it. I mean, that has to be correct because what kind of, if the, if the data is not correct, the machine can probably not really uh, work with it correctly. How do you make sure, and I mean, you have lots of suppliers, I would suppose, it's probably the thousand, ten thousands, I don't know how much it is. How do you make sure that the master data is 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 correct? Um, we, first of all, we have, we, there is an organizational um, uh, building block. So we have a master data organization and, um, and we closely work together with them, not just on an organizational basis. We also build up a system landscape right, right now where there's a, a clear starting point for, for suppliers coming to fight, and there is a clear change process so that we have a kind of golden record in our, in our master data uh, uh, database. And, and, and this is, yeah, this is, this is about, yeah. So it, it need, needs a clear process. Uh, also changes and it needs um, a single point of truth, uh, a golden record for supplier master data. And this is something we, we build up um, and yeah, because we have, a, we have a real need in that and there are some more suppliers than just 10,000. <laughs> okay, see, I, I don't know that much uh, about your business as you can see, but um, good, to, good, to, good to hear. Um, Dagmar, I mean, you probably have to deal with this kind of data as well a lot. And you have, I will not guess how many customers you have now because probably it would be wrong anyway. So, <laughs> but I mean, you have to deal with your customers. And of, of course, a lot of your customers, they want to know, they want to have transparency about your, the supply chain. And, but I mean, to make this possible, you also have to get uh, good data from your customers. Is that, a, is that a huge topic from your side as well? Definitely is, and I'm pretty sure Klaus will have to say something about this as well for Siemens. <laughs> um, so um, 
honestly, I'm astonished how much we all, how much both of you have, have just mentioned all the keywords that I kind of forgot on my uh, little sheet of paper yeah, to mention. Um, it really fits all nicely together. Yes, we do have a master data organization as well. Yeah, But like Klaus said before, we actually don't only have one. We have it in our units also driven down locally yeah, because these people know best what the meaning of their master data also is. But we have a global coordination for master data in a so-called um, uh, data analytics and uh, uh, data lake center of excellence. Yeah, And these people are, are really there for helping the colleagues get going with their projects, guiding them. Yeah. But not exactly like Klaus said before, yeah, not ruling top down, this is how right works for you and this is how wrong works for you. Because oftentimes, by the way, Alexander, I, I don't know why you, why you think master data is boring. I, I find it highly interesting yeah, the moment <laughs> I start looking into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you really, there, there is oftentimes no real way to say right or wrong. Yeah? And, and almost every of our customer has more than one settlements, um, plans, etc. so on. They also change like we kind of every second day. So keeping that up to date is a challenge that you just need to get your entire organization aware that in the age of digitalization, they need to get that right at the start, not as an afterthought. Yeah? And once you have that mindset in, um, your, your, your master data slowly but surely over time becomes trackable better. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then with some guidance of the central center of excellence, we're, we're getting there. Yeah? We have some governance in place, but minimal, as I said, most of it needs to come from our people anyway. Klaus, has it been a topic in your transformation process as well, dealing with this topic? Because I can imagine um, making sure that the master data is, is fine is can be a real pain for your employees. But on the other hand, it can really help a lot if it is, if the stage is that it is, uh, is, is fine and correct, right? Absolutely, fully agree. And why I'm smiling a little bit was, was the point that the master data piece is something which is in the organization for, for decades. Okay. <laughs> right. And many, many people thought, hey, great, now we get all these new analytics and, and we can, can get rid of all these painfully hard actions to clean up the master data. And I said recently to my all guys, at once. <laughs> yeah, no, no, just one click. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and I said to my people, look, um, these master data cleansing, and by the way, it's not only a supply master data, it's also our own product master data. So that means what we want to buy from our, <laughs> from our partners. The master data issue is for me, it's a pure discipline issue. Okay. And uh, I compared it a little bit with the, with the exercise. We have to brush your Piece. Okay. Um, maybe you have maybe you have kids, okay? Maybe you have kids in a, in an age of 10 or 12. At least I have the discussion every morning. Um, have you brushed your teeth? Okay. And and the older one said, Hey, look, I don't have time today because I have to hurry up for the bus. The younger one, he's eight, he said, hmm, I did it yesterday, why should I do it today? And this reminds me a little, little bit of these things um, that, we, that we have to convince our organization again and again, it is not an extra effort to clean up your master data. You should not question it every day, you should do it every day. And this is a disciplined thing. Yes, and of course we have now nice tools which helps us. But at the very end, again, it's a discipline thing. You have to adopt this, you have to implement it, and then you can benefit from that. This is one aspect. And the other aspect, this is also what we experienced. Once you have the right data, 
then you have the situation that around you they are coming out of a company and say I have cool analytics and with my analytics I can solve any problem any question you have mm. and then the organization starts to say whoops which kind of question do I have which I want that the analytics can answer and then all of a sudden we realize that the data quality per se is, is not the real value we got to have the ability to bring it together in a data lake which we can easily access so the accessibility to this data lake is another thing because um, if you have analytics without the right data lake it's just an analytics mm -hmm. And on the other side, the data without the right analytics is also just only pure data. And these are the things we have to match and find out where is this famous added value? How can we describe it? Now, digitalization per se is no added value. It should finally come to the point that either it makes life easier for the people or, and hopefully this is the final point, we have this clear impact on the PL. Mm -hmm. And it's not so easy to make this translation where it really hits the bottom line or where it's just an extra. Yeah. So, so I, I can make an example about the bottom line. So you, you can use these nice tools, artificial intelligence, to categorize your spend. So you, you make more spend visible. But if, if the buyers do not touch this additional spend and do something with that, it, it stays it stays a number of figure in, in the system so and about accessibility this is also something what what, what we drive in, and i fully agree uh, today we have still a prohibitive high effort to 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 to, uh, to work with the information with the data and this should be should become better uh, even better in a self-service so that the colleagues can easily use data and work with that not needing yeah. always the the experts uh, as a bottleneck. Yeah. And, and maybe another example uh, to build on what you said, we all have this Swiss channel um, in mind, okay? Mm -hmm. So transparency-wise or traceability-wise was not a big deal for us to figure out where is our stuff. Mm -hmm. The real point is what's then your alternative? How can you manage your your problem the problem is how do you get your material on site mm -hmm. so and that brings us back to the old discussions what's with your uh, single source strategy what's with your sole uh, sole source strategy do you have uh, enough strategic ideas how you can manage that stuff so uh, what i'm trying to say is digitalization creates a lot of transparency but it maybe will not answer the question what you then have to do let me let me just get get a short remark from one of our listeners into the discussion which i think fits in very well um honestly speaking to all of the panelists and i would like to maybe direct it to to dagmar um how mature and how prepared are your internal it structures in regards to digitizing processes our experience is that it is possible quite easily to digitalize processes locally with local structures, but that it is a big challenge to connect different tools, regions, departments, and everything. Um, can you can we refer to that? Absolutely. So just um, mentioning a bit of my personal lifetime at DHL and also experience. Yeah. Um, you mentioned it, Sebastian, before I started heading the corporate digitalization and IT office, I was with DHL Global Forwarding. Um, if some of you were around that market in about 2013 or 14, you will have noticed that from Global Forwarding, there came some quite disturbing messages to the market where we basically wrote off an entirely failed rollout of a new system, big time. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. It was, not only was it for the company a near catastrophe, but uh, very personally speaking, also for myself at the time. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, what happened is we pulled ourselves together and we made it happen with what we called initially the plan B. Mm -hmm. And the plan B, the, the main difference that we made between 
the original try and the second and last try that we had is the second and last try we did ourselves. We started with our own stuff. We started together with our local companies, not, not across them and on their head, not with an army of external consultants. Excuse me if you are an external consultant, but just saying it out loud here. Yeah. <laughs> and we just listened to our people and, and noticed what is the real important like base stuff that they have to execute day to day. And what is the stuff that we can, can change in their systems in their day to day life? So that is how we went out and selected the system. And this is how, how our over eight years, we replaced the entire transport management base including the master data, including the reporting system for 150 countries, I think, for both the air and the ocean transport um, facilities. It's a major effort. When we started it, nobody even deemed it possible to roll out that size of a program in that time. Yeah? The way we done it, and I would do it ever again in that way, is to take it country by country, talk to the country people, learn from the first country before you go to the second country. So I find this super relevant because it now also sets us in the position in global forwarding to finally really move ahead into reaping the benefits out of this. Mm. Yeah, because you have to transfer these really old systems. And, and here we are talking about systems that had green screens still. Yeah, In 2012, we were working with systems that had orange letters on, screen, on, on green screens. Yeah? So <laughs> we had to replace that all first before we could seriously think about moving on with, with getting all the benefits in. Yeah, But now we're there. We're done with that. Yeah. And we're, we're like super proud of, of that, really. And I am, for sure. Well, I think, Thanks for the question. Um, Loved it. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much for the, for the, for the answer. Um, I think we have to come to an end. Um, if I would like, if I would summarize it, and I think we could get into a lot of these points deeper. Um, what I got from your from your remarks, I mean, it's it's really important to to look at your data, your master data. That is that that is correct. You have to do it step by step, as you just mentioned, Dagmar. If you want to do this kind of transformation, uh, Klaus, you, you mentioned and pointed out how important it is to not just do everything uh, top down but bottom up. You really have to listen to your people, get them involved, uh, and then you will have the reward of uh, great ideas that you probably haven't expected yourself. Um, it has been a very, very uh, nice, interesting discussion with you. Thank you very much for joining today. And uh, we will now head into the second edition or the second panel, uh, where I think we will get more to speak about the, the solutions that can help to digitize uh, the international supply chains and probably also talk about AI, uh, blockchain, these kind of technologies a bit more, which we didn't get the chance to talk about now. Uh, thanks for now very much. It was a great pleasure to have you here, and maybe we see you a little later on uh, at the end of the of the of the workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. Um, so with that, um, I would like to uh, get our next three speakers to the panel for our best practice session, and. Um, here we see the first of them, it's Heiko Schwarz from Risk Methods. I would also, Oliver Neumann from Cargo One, great to have you here. And is Carl Loron? Yeah, there you are. Hello, Carl, great to have you here. Hi there. All right, everybody Hello, can everyone. hear us, talk to us. Very good, sounds like yeah. that. Very good. Is that All okay? Right. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, very good. All right. Um, we will start with Carl. Um, then we will have Oliver um, presenting his solution. And the third in line will be Heiko with uh, Risk Methods. Um, let's, let me just introduce you, Carl, real quick. And then I'll do accordingly with, uh, with the other two. Carl, you are the CEO and founder of Bico, it's a, a French startup. Um, it's a collaborative platform for container shipping. You founded it in 2015, um, not just out of an idea, but um, you 
you had lots of experience in container shipping yourself. You worked for CMA, CGM, um, the French container shipping line. You were there in charge of the freight forwarding div division and later on you were uh, a vice president for innovation there. So, I mean, you were, you were right at the connection between kind of the, the old business, uh, the, the, the things the business has to perform and um, the possibilities there are through innovation. And we look very much forward to hear what you have to say to us um, and present us your BICO uh, solutions. The floor is yours for the next 10 minutes, Carl. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Sebastian. Um, so yeah, I, I think what we are living now is a fantastic moment in uh, uh, in logistics. Uh, digitalization is changing the, the way we are working, and and uh, it's an industry that uh, needs to be changed because it's full of old-fashioned processes and way of working. And digital solutions can really help. So if we can go to next slide, please. Yeah, so this is basically our, um, our uh, battlefield. This is how complex container shipping is. Uh, when you want to send a container from the middle of China to the middle of Germany, you've got between 15 and 20 different companies who will do something uh, regarding these containers. So you can imagine from an operational basis, it's, it's a bit of a chaos. Uh, and we are measuring the number of emails uh, within our customers uh, to manage uh, one, one shipment and we are getting to close uh, to 200 emails per shipment so you can imagine with the number of uh, shipments a large company can have it, it becomes completely chaotic so uh, what we what we try to what we've done if we can go to next uh, slide to to fight against this high complexity lack of visibility and control we have built a solution where we, we have three pillars. Uh, the first one is collaboration. And we talked about it during the first uh, session with other, uh, the other uh, panelists. I think this is absolutely crucial in supply chain. You need to collaborate with this number of suppliers and, and stakeholders uh, that, are, uh, that exist in the, in the container business. And you have to make them work together and, and not uh, one after the other in a sequential mode. Uh, so collaboration is in one of our pillars and then uh, we have the what we call the execution. This, this is the ability to to deal on a digital on a digital basis with uh, with carriers and the various stakeholders that can be uh, so ocean carriers, uh, freight forwarders, uh, importers, exporters, plants, etc. And for instance, we were talking uh, in the earlier uh, panel about uh, data, uh, master data, and data quality. This is crucial in in today's world, actually not only to digitize the execution, but also to automatize it. And, and nowadays with current technology, we can clearly automate a lot of, lot of processes, uh, like taking a booking with a, with a carrier, that, that, can be, uh, that can be automated, uh, for instance. And three pillar, third pillar of, uh, of our company is uh, providing tracking, visibility, and, uh, and actually uh, high quality data lakes to enable our customers to follow their, their flow. So if, when, if we can go to next uh, slide. And uh, in current business uh, environment, as you know, we have been hit by a very difficult operational uh, performance from carriers and the entire logistics. Um, you all know about uh, the ever given uh, problem, about the, the congestion in ports, about the lack of equipment, the lack of, uh, of uh, vessels. And at the end of the day, we, we made a, an analysis to, to show uh, a little bit this chaos. And uh, over the last three years, if we just look at the number of, uh, the number of time where a shipment is more than one week late versus what has been planned during uh, a booking. It went from like 20% to more than 50% currently. And that's the, the, the visible, that's the result of uh, all the, the hiccups we've, uh, we've uh, experienced uh, in the past, in the, the post-COVID uh, crisis. 
And wh when you think about it, it it's a bit of a, a, a nightmare for all customers because 80% of the efforts of the, of the operational team are there to manage the 20% of, of uh, chaos shipment. And now the 20% of chaos shipment becomes more than half of the shipment. So uh, uh, managing 80% of your time, 20% of problems, if your problems uh, are raising to 60%, you are just getting crazy to manage them. It's just impossible. And, and, and this is where uh, we, we clearly see the need of, uh, of digital solution. And, and that's, where, that's where digital can, can help to manage these non-happy flow uh, processes. It's, uh, it's to, to make quick and fast decisions when problems occur. Uh, we cannot solve them. I mean, we cannot do anything about the lack of equipment and the lack of vessels. But what we can do is provide the, the, the good quality answer to day-to-day uh, -day operational problems uh, by sharing the, the good uh, data and the good updates of, uh, of the shipment. So that, that's what we do in BICO. And if we can go to next slide. Um, and this is why we have, uh, hopefully, a couple of customers. And as, as Klaus has said from Siemens at the beginning of this, uh, this conference, the, we, we have the chance to, to identify customers who have uh, helped us to go from uh, a proof of concept to uh, global scale uh, flows and, and to scale to manage 100% of, of their, their business. And as a startup, it's, it's a, a a true challenge to uh, to find those type of customers who are ready to embark innovation coming from uh, from such or such country to 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 scale it and and to have 100 percent of their business uh, run through a new new way of uh, of working so you you can imagine that uh, currently it's already a bit uh, a bit of a chaos to manage uh, container shipments uh, but guess what be prepared for for next Next problem, and next problem is going to, to come pretty strongly. If we can go to next slide. This will be our next problem in international shipping. That will be CO2 management. If we can go to next slide, please. Uh, in uh, international transport, uh, we represent uh, like 8% of the, uh, the overall emission on the planet which is significant and then we have to do something about it and as we plan to multiply the number of uh, moves on the planet by four within the next uh, 20 years it means that we have to reduce at least by four in terms of ton per uh, ton of co2 per uh, per container uh, the, the the environment uh, performance which is a bit of a challenge we are not talking about a small reduction and if we want can we go to next slide, please? So that will become a, a key challenge for everybody as, as a new problem to tackle on top of all what we know already is that CO2 costs will become as important as the transport cost itself. So even if you don't care about uh, saving the planet, even if you don't care about uh, answering to your children, uh, hey dad, what have you done to reduce CO2 footprint in your business? You will be hit by, uh, in your P&L, by, by CO2 cost, and, and that will become as important as transport cost. So uh, we all have in, uh, in organization tons of people who are there to manage and to optimize transport cost. I'm not sure we have as many people and uh, and as many tools to manage CO2 uh, currently. So that, that will become uh, a key challenge for uh, everybody. And if we can go to next slide. And, and uh, just to show you the, the impact it can have, that, that's the good thing about it. We can do a lot to reduce CO2. Huh? It's not an impossible mission. If we just have a look at uh, the impact, so this is a, this is a, a simulation that has been done by uh, our uh, one of our partners, Heroes, who is a half French, half German company. We are working with them on estimating the CO2 emissions uh, uh, done by ships, by vessels. And what you can see here is that uh, if you take a large vessel, like a 20,000 TU vessel running at the slow steaming, and if you, if you compare 
the emission of such large vessels slow steaming to uh, small vessel running full speed on the same uh, port of loading, port of, port of discharge, you have uh, an emission factor of nine. So depending on the choice you are going to do on selecting the right vessel, you can have an impact of 90% on your CO2 emissions. So that means that in, in our future supply chain, and that will come pretty soon because I don't know if you saw that last week, European Commission has identified international transport as a key, uh, a key element, and they are going to include international transport in their, uh, what they call ETS, uh, CO2 calculation. And we, we all have to pay when we'll get in and out uh, Europe for our flows. So that, that will become critical to be in a position to manage within your, your, your systems not only the ETD and ETA of vessels, not only is it a direct or to give a transshipment uh, flow, uh, not only what's the cost of the transport, not only to manage the, your allocation with such or such carrier, but you will, we will also have to manage vessel by vessel the CO2 emissions of the, the, the flows you are, you are going to, to have. And you will then have an impact on, on vessel choice and you will have to get control of selecting the vessel you are going to use in your supply chain. This will be an extra layer of complexity on, on, on top of what we already have today. And I guess that if you, if, uh, you don't have a good digital uh, tool to manage that, it will be a bit complicated. So let, let's not panic. There are solutions, but we, we clearly have to take that into account as the, the, the end of the operational nightmare has not come when it's down to managing containers uh, around the planet. And by the way, that, that's what we do in Baiko, of course. I think I've done my, my 10 minutes, Sebastian. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, well, we, we, we haven't uh, finished the, the, the last uh, challenges, but now you, you raise the next challenge, but of course um, we have all read about it. I think we will talk about it a little later on. Thank you very much for the moment, Carl. And um, now I would like to hand it over to Oliver. Um, we come from um, sea freight to, to air freight, and let me introduce Oliver real quick. Um, uh, Oliver is um, the um, uh, managing director and one of the founders of Cargo One. It's a it's a platform for booking and marketing air freight capacity. Um, you founded it in 2017. Um, have been a serial entrepreneur before that as well. And um, we're looking forward to hear what you have to tell us about the the air freight industry of today, how it all works, maybe not works, and uh, how it should work in the future. Oliver, it's all it, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, thanks, Sebastian, and thanks to the ICC for the kind invitation. Happy to be here and to talk a little bit about Air Cargo and Cargo One. Um, so yeah, uh, Cargo One, we are a platform for Air Cargo for Air Freight. If we move forward to the next slide to give you some insight about um, our company. So we are a fully remote company. We currently hire in 18 countries. We have employees in most of those countries as well and constantly expanding the country list. Um, where our employees live and work. We are currently 75 employees. We have raised roughly 60 million US dollars from lots of venture capitalists, but also from the funds of Siemens and Lufthansa Cargo. Um, what do we do? We solve the process that is on the next slide. And um, I know that you need to bear with me here because throwing a very complex slide at you might not seem very fair. Um, but it just gives you an overview on kind of the complexity that we have already kind of seen in the I think, shipping world that Carl just presented also in the uh, cargo world. So shipper would get in contact with lots of freight forwarders. The freight forwarders try to get quotes because today you get quotes for air cargo via email and telephone. So you need to reach out to the different airlines. The airlines would get the same request from three different freight forwarders and try to define a price. Um, this would take some time and they would then return to the freight forwarder who would then return back to the shipper who can then make a decision for um, the transport method that they want to choose or kind of the freight forwarder they would use. All this is extremely labor intensive and time consuming um, and it is extremely volatile. So in markets where prices change constantly, 
the time difference needed to actually compile an offer makes it makes it extremely inefficient for the parties involved because everybody carries risk of price changes and this is why people um, account for higher offers just to make sure that if somebody comes back the price is still viable um, so the way we approach it is exactly the other way around the way you would know as a passenger when you book your own flights so if we move to the next slide um, we um, have built um, a easy air cargo booking and distribution solution we have built software for airlines um, to make them able to enable them to digitally distribute the capacity to revenue management to loadability checks everything that is currently done manually will help them and we operate for them to be digital and then we offer freight forward as a very very simple and user-friendly tool um, to see an overview of a the life available capacity um, from the involved carriers um, as well as kind of a live overview and live booking capabilities uh, with those carriers. Um, this obviously um, decreases the complexity immensely. This allows freight forwarders to be way more competitive because they have access to instant live market rates um, and um, just makes them, uh, you know, do more transactions in a shorter amount of time for less cost. Um, if we move forward, whom are we doing this with? To just give you an overview of kind of maybe the relevance uh, a little bit. So most of the top 10 forwarders in the world are using us, many of the top 50, but also the SME freight forwarders are um, very important customers to ours to, with whom we work very closely, as well as the digital freight forwarders. So the flex ports and photos of this world use us for their cargo uh, booking. Um, currently we're available in Europe, um in 14 countries if i'm not mistaken um and um as uh, we kind of work with other uh, with our customers very closely um they are quite happy with the solution and i think that's something that dr Stolz has said before i also very much subscribe to the notion that it's all about people um to work in logistics is to have empathy uh, with the people that run those processes and technology is tooling to help them to do that better and that is very much the philosophy how we build technology we very closely engage with our customers we do uh, co-development workshops with them we invite them uh, to berlin or to the um, kind of local organizations where we then um, do prototypes together um, we do we allow our employees to do internships with freight forwarding companies to actually see how the processes work and how we can support with technology um, so that was something that resonated very well with me. Um, similarly, the digitizing of a crappy process. Um, so kind of thinking further and it's not just taking the existing process and giving it a nice front end, but really understanding what the value is and how technology can help fundamentally um, drive that value for people and going further um, to what people can maybe just expect. Um, yeah, moving forward to give you a quick overview. Um, so location wise, um, from a, a kind of expert perspective, we are already covering most of Europe. Uh, we now um, started um, in North America and the US and Canada, and now expanding uh, globally, um, essentially on a monthly basis, adding countries. Um, to give you maybe a quick overview, as this has been um, in our lives, a very central topic around COVID. Um, so moving to the next slide. Um, COVID obviously had a tremendous impact on air cargo. Um, so what you can see here on the left hand side, um, the dark line are the departures from Frankfurt Airport. There were on a daily basis around 750, 850 departures. This dropped to between um, uh, 70 and 80 departures, um, kind of in the early days of COVID. And the red bars that you can see are the searches on Cargo One for capacity from Frankfurt. Um, so we saw that while capacity was going away, people were looking for alternatives, people were looking for ways to access capacity. And that obviously tremendously pushed digital solutions because also from home office, from no matter where you were, they were accessible um, and um, Cargo One um, helped those freight forwarders to actually um, make their business happen in times of um, strict uncertainty. 
What you can also see with um, dropping um, supply um, while demand stays fairly constant or even increased um, a little bit through the flying of um, masks and other equipment, prices spiked. Um, so we saw a strict increase when COVID started of prices um, on the platform, and this is all ex-Europe, so leaving Europe. Um, and prices stayed extremely high because capacity is still missing in the market. Um, it actually increased further in Q1 this year. Um, so um, air cargo is very expensive. Um, kind of moving forward to the next slide. Um, looking at the outlook, and these are um, different studies. IATA has just released a study around this. Um, so as you can see from kind of the available capacity, um, we dropped to around 10% and the market still remains at an extremely low when it comes to our cargo capacity, especially on international routes. So I think if many of you have already been to airports, I think recently the airports are still buzzing. Frankfurt is open again. It's crowded. Uh, but this is leisure um, travel. This is um, short haul before long haul. Um, it's not overlapping with kind of the large trade lanes. Um, and the expectations are that by the end of 2022, we'll reach roughly 75% of the capacity that we had before the crisis. Um, so we do not expect a steep um, incline, um, uh, a steep increase um, of capacity shortly, but it will take some time. Um, connected to that, um, is that the market from uh, our expectation will remain a seller's market. So prices will remain high through mid 2022 um, as demand um, for freight um, is very strong still um, and planes are fully booked, especially all the cargo planes. And the people who kind of follow this industry will see that every airline in the world is trying to get their hands of new planes. Um, and kind of building out those um, parts of their business. Um, but this is at least the expectation that the industry is having when it comes to um, the capacity returning. Um, this is all that I have for today. Thanks for having me. Um, Thanks yeah. a lot, Oliver. Just a, just a real quick question before we get to our th uh, third panelist, uh, Heiko. Um, I mean, you, you showed this really impressive chart where it, where it shows how the, uh, um, the the usage of your platform has really peaked pretty much March 20, uh, 2020 and from then on has always been very high. One could say, okay, everybody is now really digitizing its processes because it's disparity. Do you, do you kind of see, uh, yeah, kind of a change in the set of mind of the people that they really see, okay, this is really digital solutions can really help me long time, uh, long term, or is it really just out of a, I have to find capacity. I use everything mm -hmm. there is on the market kind of. Um, so look, certainly it's a trigger um, that people are looking for capacity, uh, but I think the value remains. So what we obviously saw when it comes to digital tools, you have early adopters that like to try things out that maybe are also in the age bracket um, where you know, they um, are not that used to their existing processes. And I think what COVID triggered was that people suddenly got access to digital tools and understood fundamentally the value that it provides to them and how it helps their workflows. And um, we very much see that we got access to, I think the new user persona, people that have been in logistics for maybe also decades and have had their processes, their email, distribution lists and etc that back in the day were their ways of working and by using uh, a platform like cargo one for a couple of months they suddenly included this in their um, repository of tools um, and um, we have so far received extremely great feedback from our users who get more and more used to working with digital tools and get more and more excited about it um, so, um, looking at all the other industries in the world, once you realize that the user experience of something is uniquely valuable to you, I think there is not much way going back. It's not like we're running back to travel agencies, right? Once you have realized that booking.com works and they're not stealing money from you, 
and that you can really cancel your hotel last minute and everybody's fine with it. Um, you know, that's um, a value that is very unique. Um, and um, yeah, we see that across different countries and different continents as well. Mm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have just pretty much got a deep insight into the air cargo industry. We have got an insight into the sea freight situation with Carl, and he has also raised the, the topic of future challenges like the sustainability discussion. And maybe to kind of wrap it up in, in, in one solution is, is, is Heiko. Heiko Schwartz, he's the uh, CEO and founder of Risk Methods. It's a supply chain risk management software company. You founded it in uh, 2013 with uh, with some colleagues. Before that, you worked as sales director at IBM and Taurus, so you have been in the IT industry before. And uh, yeah, uh, we are looking forward to see what Risk Methods is is doing for its customers in the in the industry. Heiko, the floor is Great. yours. Great, thanks. Warm welcome to everyone, and uh, thanks, Sebastian, for the moderation and ICC for the invitation um, to this event. And also kudos to my previous speakers, Dagmar, Klaus, Alexander, who shape supply chain and, and procurement practice as, as experts. And um, congrats, Carl, Oliver, for, for founding such amazing businesses. Um, impressive. Well, speaking about us and the topic of supply chain risk management, um, we started back in 2013 to empower our customers, irrespective of their company size, to master risks within their supply networks and create sustainable, reliable supply networks. And thanks, Dagmar, for the clicks in the background. Moving from one slide to the next. Or is it Dana? Right, Dana, excuse me. Well, and the reason why we founded the business is um, risks happen all around the world, all around the time. One more click, please. So in average, three critical earthquakes hit supply chain operations every day. Not necessarily your business, but many other businesses are affected. One more click, please. Every second day, just within the automotive industry, a sup supplier site is burning and interrupts the operations. Another click, please. Within the COVID crisis, back in Q2 2020, only within our 200 customer counting audience or customer audience, more than 50,000 supplier sites have been affected by lockdowns. Another click, please. And last but not least, still being on a low in terms of bankruptcies within Germany, while over 2020, almost historic low, companies face 44 bank or insolvencies each day just in Germany. So what does that tell us? One more click, please. Obviously, a, okay, so that was another click, fine. Um, Gartner Group um, states that only two of 10 executives describe their supply networks as highly resilient. It means we are not prepared. Another click, please. And referring to, Klaus Staubitzer's um, statement, how does digitization impact the bottom line or the top line of the business? McKinsey Institute states that shocks that are affecting global production are growing more severe. In an average, companies lose due to firefighting costs to 4.2% uh, of EBITDA year over year. Tremendous impact on the competitiveness of businesses. Another click, please. And here we are, that's my conclusion. A resilient supply chain is a competitive one. You can mix the words and say, competitive supply chains are resilient supply chains as well, right? So how can digital help businesses to cope with these challenges? One more click, Dana. Because digital really makes the difference. Digital allows companies to identify threats and continuously monitor these threats along their supply networks with complete automation, which means the experts within the procurement and supply chain departments 
can spend their time and domain knowledge on the categories, on the parts that they are acquiring, that they are shipping to the production and that they are sending out to their customers to better understand how critical a potential impact to the supply network would be to assess and these criticalities or impacts and to allow a prioritization and fast crisis reaction in the case that something non-predictive um, hits the supply network or to be risk aware and understand where preventive actions really protect the company in advance before risk materializes. And that allows proactive behavior to collaborate with the supply network, with the supply chain actors, the shippers, the forwarders, the suppliers, the suppliers of the suppliers, because transparency is a fundament um, to, to drive action, to be capable to write, drive actions. And for that, analytics is a um, key component um, to provide the intelligence and the insight that businesses need uh, to become more proactive. So to say digital allows companies to become more risk aware as a foundation to react faster and become proactive and avoid that supply chain hassle hits their companies. Another click, please. As we talk digital and digitization, these kind of solutions like ours became real because of uh, new modern um, digital levers being available and affordable at the same time. AI and machine learning powering our global data capture and especially power the noise cancellation to make sure the experts don't get flooded with risk indications every hour because something potentially risky happens all around the world as we have seen. Rather distilling down all these data sets from global media publications, billions of websites that publish information, natural hazard databases from insurance companies, rating agencies, sustainability scoring providers, et cetera, et cetera, to bring that all down into one, one stop for risk information, to geocode that information, to make sure that seaports, airports, warehouses, supplier sites, wherever a storm is approaching are detected by technology. So you get a prediction of where this storm might impact the supply chains at most. And for sure, big data is processed within these um, background procedures and um, the detection of non-structured information as part of the natural language processing is, is an, is an um, topic to, to master all those millions and millions of data sets and publications every day. It has to be brought on the mobile devices, on the go, every time, anywhere to drive adoption. This is what the previous speakers have addressed by scalability. Like a digital process, even if it's excellent, it's worth little if there's no adoption, no scale within the enterprise. And easiness of use, hiding complexity in the background is key success factor to roll out these kind of solutions, especially in larger organizations. To allow also predictive insights to be ahead of the risk. One more click, please. So we spoke a lot about digital. I thought I, I bring some, some screenshots so you can get impressions about digital solutions look like when they are used within um, organizations. Graphical representations of networks, as you can see on the screenshot with all those supply chains and interconnections and dependencies and color codes to easily identify threatened areas or situations. Um, where the red becomes more prominent, rather the green stuff. Scoring mechanism in scorecards, as we can see in the middle of the screen, that highlight trends or risky situations with red color to make the professionals and experts aware of rising threats or even risks that materialize. And on the right bottom of the screen, analytics to allow technology to point out on the silver tablet, um, the negative trends, the patterns within the data sets to let category managers, supply chainers, logistic experts understand where situations are getting worse and worse so they can be ahead of the risk and rethink sole, single source, multiple store situations, um, inventory buffering, et cetera, um, what could be the best preparation for rising threats or what would be the right response. Another click, please. 
understanding criticality was one of the topics that I mentioned. We see this portfolio chart where a category manager can drop um, the suppliers of his responsibility area to better understand how long will be the relocation time from one source to the another. Um, can the supplier heal himself? What is the total recovery time? Um, how much inventory is on stock? How much time can I survive without a supply chain operating? Embracing the suppliers as collaborators within the process to also support them to foster resilience within their supply chain. We are just launching in August a product to detect sub-tiers. And Alexander from Foyd mentioned the Supply Chain Act, uh, where the visibility into the lower tiers of the supply networks becomes a really prominent topic, aside of also detecting non-ethical behavior in terms of human rights, but also environment, et cetera. Make the suppliers a part of the solution. Another click, please. And we have heard a lot about COVID. I'm not going to stress this more. It has been the wake up call for, for our domain um, latest. And um, this, this um, procurement professional, Josep um, from ECHO, um, mainly known as Tractor Builders with a brand Fendt in, in very well known in, in Europe, um, they could leverage um, risk management within supply chain to turn risk into a competitive advantage even, right? It's for sure it's about protecting the business and reducing unplanned cost and impacts to the manufacturing and delivery side of, of the, the customer base, rather than also being able to deliver while others can't. And that turns risk into a competitive advantage. Another click. So serving leaders, large companies, small companies, manufacturing as the main headline um, is the typical audience that we address because they ship physical products within their supply networks. And last but not least, to end up my speech um, with a call to action to all listeners of um, our today's session, please another click. Um, we want to, or I want to, to motivate you to unleash the potentials that we unleash with technologies like risk methods technology to make your organization more risk aware, to allow your procurement supply chain is to react faster and even drive prevention because that is impacting the top and bottom line and the reputation of your business. Avoid unplanned costs, protect your brands and meet customer demands. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Heike, very much. Um, um, I would like to ask um, Alexander from the first um, session on the screen again. I think he is still online, Dagmar and um, Klaus, uh, unfortunately, already had to leave. There you are, Alexander. Great to have you here again. Um, Heiko, maybe one, one question directly directed to you. Um, I mean, you you show your customers different options and you discuss this different options to react to supply chain um, um, uh, interruptions and all these kind of things. I mean, one, of course, can... Uh, maybe change its buffer strategy. One can maybe even think about relocating production sites. These are really, um, yeah, big time uh, decisions. And on the other hand, of course, one can decide to well, okay, let's try to monitor the situation as as good as it is possible with with a digital solution. Um, how how do your customers react? I mean, do they always always think about the the big picture, the big uh, decisions, or are they more looking towards, okay, let's let's maybe try it with a digital solution first? Um, I think the nature of our solution is a decision supporting solution. Finally, the lead buyer, category manager, supply chain, and they run their business decision based on their knowledge and the support of our technology to better understand the options and the status quo and the related impact of the status quo in crisis scenarios, especially to focus where to prioritize in situations when um, multiple supply chains are affected and you get to firefight with 50, 60 suppliers at the same point in time because you don't have the resources to do everything at the same, uh, same, uh, same time. So in that regards, um, I would say um, successful companies will always 
establish that kind of business process successfully if they consider the humans being part of the process and solution and leverage their know-how and domain expertise and automate everything to come up to a good decision for execution. And I, I believe that the solutions that we have seen today are fantastic use cases um, that really help to automate stuff that should be automated and provide the decision space and the insights to the professionals that they need to make better business decisions. Mm. Maybe a, a fun question to you, Carl, and, and Alexander as well. Um, I mean, in the first session, the scaling of digital solutions was a big, big uh, discussion point. And Carl, you just mentioned, okay, there's this big challenge coming up with sustainability. Do you see that kind of as a trigger that digital solutions will really now scale as, as the panelists in the first session uh, uh, raised the question? Because otherwise, we just can't handle this this new challenge. Oh, you're first. Uh. Well, I I think I think uh, uh, I mean, the the answer is yes. Uh, it it would not have been the case if, uh, for instance, uh, CO2 uh, impact was marginal. Yeah. But but CO2 will become a, a major chunk of uh, transportation and logistics costs. So uh, you, it, it means that uh, shippers must absolutely get a grip on execution uh, decisions, on options, uh, and they have to do those choices themselves. And they, they cannot uh, anymore close their eyes and, and subcontract those decisions to third parties because that will, that will impact too much their P&L. So I guess to, uh, to be manageable, I mean, knowing the, the existing level of, uh, of chaos people have to manage on a day-to-day -day basis, adding this extra layer of complexity with CO2, uh, people will need uh, digital tools to make, to, to, to make it happen. Uh, otherwise, they, they, will, they will pay a tremendous cost and that will impact their competitiveness. So, so yes, the, this complexity will lead to more uh, digital uh, solutions uh, scale-up. And uh, that, that will scale within companies, for sure. Alexander, would you agree? I mean, from, from your side, you're probably yes. one of the companies he just addressed. Um, yes, yes, I agree. Um, but I would also like to add that I think it's, it's, it would not work without the digital tools. So because the, the effort would be prohibitive too high mm -hmm. to manage um, these challenges and to, to comply with, with what is, for example, in the Supply Chain Act expected from, from corporates. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, thinking about just implementing a, a, a solution without having the content in it, it's also not working. So what I, what I mean is, um, I like your solution uh, risk method, uh, Heiko, um, uh, but of course the, the full power of your system comes from having the supply chains or at least tier one uh, properly um, drawn in your system or mapped into your system. So that, and, 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 and with that it comes to a prioritization in our business. So we, we cannot monitor um, all our suppliers um, this would not be absolutely not feasible. So it, we need to have a prioritization and we need to have the content in the systems. And both together um, would, would, be a, would be a wonderful mixture and would uh, improve our decision making. So that fits perfectly in our understanding. Digitization is, is also a lot about better decision making. Um, with information, usually uh, you don't have because the effort is too high or not available at all. I think this sums it up. This, this was a kind of a good final word. Um, we have to come to an end. Our workshop uh, has to come to an end. Um, I think we got some really interesting insight. I already summarized my view of the first panel session. If I look at the second one, I would say, I mean, challenging times like these really show how, how important new solutions, how important new ways of thinking the supply chain, the customer needs are. And uh, I would say, Cargo One, uh, Bico, and and risk methods really are good examples for this uh, this approach. And um, 
Gentlemen, thank you very much to everybody from you. Um, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. And uh, look to look forward to see you again sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. And bye. Well, with that, I think uh, we can we can sum it up. Uh, it was a real pleasure. I hope everybody in the audience got some some interesting insights. Um, I really enjoyed. It was very interesting. And uh, yeah, have a good day. And thank you very much from my side as well. Bye bye.